Introducing a priori. Good morning, everybody. Morning? Come on. It's Tuesday and we're all together. Isn't this amazing? It's awesome. So I want to also thank you. You know, it's the last couple of years being virtual. We've had some great sort of digital conversations one on one. But the one thing that we've heard from many of you over the years, you know, going back to our first conference 10 years ago, is the value of having time to talk to your peers, right? And so being able to get back together again really provides all of us that opportunity to you know, talk about what we're doing, the challenges we're facing, and what we can do to address them. So thank you for being with us for the next two days. It's going to be, you know, there's a lot that's happened in the last two years, so we have a lot to talk about. Um, we're facing perhaps you know, some of the most significant disruption that we've seen in a long time, perhaps ever, you know, if you look at all of the, the challenges in front of us. Hence, you know, we're trying to look at how we can address those challenges. But on top of that, we're being faced with environmental issues and thus you know, needing to address sustainability. That's why we've really chosen this as the theme of our conference this year, you know, making profitability and sustainability a reality. And although covering this topic in two days is a, probably a big, is a bit ambitious, we're going to do our best to arm you with the best practices and, and really valuable insights to address these challenges. You'll discover how the evolution of our manufacturing capabilities, as well as new features from our Manufacturing Insights platform, is going to support you in really optimizing costs, improving manufacturability issues, and reducing carbon emissions. That's going to be a new theme that we're going to talk about this year. Um, I'd like to thank all of our customers and our partners that Philippe just showed you all of the work that's gone into the conference from not just us, but from our whole community to help bring a lot of these insights to you to you know, learn more about the, how to address these challenges. We all know that over the past 12 months, um, we've really been faced with a number of challenges. Inflation is the highest it's been in 40 years. I don't need to tell you that. We just need to go to the gas station, right? Try and fill up your car. Um, and, and product price performance, though, that ratio has always been a hot topic for manufacturing. Um, but looking at the escalation of material prices and manufacturing costs, that's really moved this again to the very top of the list in terms of challenges we have to address. Global supply chain disruption, you're going to hear a lot about this through the conference because it's another hot topic that started three years ago before the pandemic. We saw that in spades. You know, there were times during the pandemic, really at the beginning, where you know, companies like Ford were burning a billion dollars a week because they couldn't get products out the door. You know, it, was, it, was, it was alarming. Now, while the pandemics ebbed, the challenge of supply chain disruptions continued. You know, so we really have to figure out how we're going to move forward and address that. You know, companies are, have, have put in place short-term fixes, but we need to develop long-term strategies that are going to help us build resilient and supply chain um, networks that won't be impacted by any future disruptions. Labor and skills gap. How many of you have been trying to hire people lately? You know? Yeah, a few. Um, you know, that's, you know, that's continued, you know, it, that's been a topic for five years, a long time. Um, but it's becoming more and more of a concern. Companies are looking for new strategies to address this challenge. And, and they're looking at some different ways. It's not just about, you know, better recruiting. But how can we automate some of the processes? So maybe it requires less labor or leveraging digital twins, um, you know, digital threads to support you know, new engineering employees could be another one. And then lastly, sustainability. And I know you're going to hear a lot about that through this whole presentation and, and through the next couple of days. But that's also becoming a priority. Adding a new dimension to the KPIs that companies are having to report to the financial community. You know, it's not just about us you know, trying to do better for the world. There are all kinds of regulatory bodies that are coming into play. And manufacturing, plan, manufacturing companies are trying to work on plans but, you know, to achieve their objectives, but they're facing a number of, of obstacles. You know, how is it going to impact my costs? What is it going to do to my competitiveness? How is it, how is it going to impact me overall? So rather than trying to cover these all in one slide, I'm going to take you through at least some of the things that we're seeing in the market and some of the ways in which we're trying to help mitigate these issues. 
So challenge number one, how to deliver higher profitability during major economic disruptions. Just this topic alone is a big one, so believe me, I won't keep you here all day. Inflation is a significant driver of cost. You know, we all know that. But companies need to keep their products competitive to, to drive growth, right? So that's a tough balance. You know, you, 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 just focusing on cost alone isn't good enough. And, you know, in most industrial sectors, we see new competitors emerging every year. You know, who would have thought like, 20 years ago, Tesla, Rivian, SpaceX, Arrivo, all these companies are brand new startups in a, an industry that's been around for a long time. And many are building new technology platforms right from scratch. They're using digital models and approaches to disrupt tech, you know, the traditional players in the market. A recent analysis of S&P 500 companies showed that these new players can make the game really challenging for some of the well-established well, well ones. Just how, look, look how fast that they grew. And we, but we see many of you adopting digital approaches to both optimize cost and drive innovation, you know, that balance. Some are approaching this by, you know, digitizing prototypes, for example. You know, they're taking selective approaches to get started, so digitizing prototypes. And they're saying that two years from now, they won't have any physical prototypes. We're seeing other companies who are looking to digitize and create a more digital interaction between buyers and suppliers, enabling that process to go much faster. And, and then yet there are others who are taking sort of a more end-to-end -end look. You know, what can we do to digitize a whole process from you know, design to production? Whatever the approach, the goals are the same. Tracking, co reducing cost while accelerating time to market and you know, through, product, through shorter product development cycles. We're seeing those collapse as well, getting shorter and shorter. Um, automotive firms that probably four, a few years ago had product design cycles that were four years. Well, now, that, you know, some cases we're hearing they're down to 18 months. Um, so whatever the approach, you know, we, need to, we need to take action. If we want to be around and relevant 10 years from now, we need to accomplish our cost and revenue objectives concurrently. So a key question for both you and us is how do we reduce costs while creating value? That's a complex task. And we've seen several different approaches that companies are pursuing. Well, uh, well cost reduction is front and center. Exploring multiple design options, you know, looking at the different trade-offs so you can not only figure out how to take costs out of what you're designing, but how to add features that give you a more competitive position in the market while still maintaining cost. So getting feedback quickly and continuously helps to improve the competitiveness of a product significantly. Optimizing the manufacturability of parts and assemblies, that's another one. You know, doing it upfront increases the design team's efficiency, helping reduce late stage churn and reduce time to market. And it, it also, though, the, the one other advantage that we're seeing, we'll talk some of, some of the cost opportunities around this, it helps free up those design teams to work on the next great thing earlier. And while product design cycles are shortening, procurement teams are more challenged than ever to get products in the door quickly or parts in the door quickly. Often they're overpaying. We're seeing, I talked to one executive not too long ago, he doesn't have enough time between when his design team finishes their design and sourcing needs to get parts in the door to be able to have them on the market to drive revenue. And so, you know, one of the things he, he recognized, so they're buying things that higher than, than their, the, the cost that they, they want to because they have to move so fast. So one of the things he recognized is he started to see them using a priori in design engineering is there's all this rich data that's now available to sourcing teams to enable them to look at what's coming down the product pipelines earlier so that they can start those conversations with suppliers. So, you know, that data really helps, provides valuable insights for those sourcing teams. So engaging sourcing and procurement earlier helps minimize risks and improves time to market materially. Lastly, anticipating risk. Or, you know, one way to manage risk is to use design to cost um, or design to source based on design to cost. You know, if your digital factories represent your current supply base, 
They're going to provide the design team with manufacturability and cost feedback based on your current manufacturing capabilities. So they're designing with the supply chain in mind, right? So you're connecting that design to the, the world, the, the ecosystem that you're interacting with as your products come to market. With all of the ideas we've heard from you, we've been evolving our capabilities to better meet your needs. And hopefully you're going to hear a lot about that over the next few days. There are multiple sessions, so I won't go through and articulate them all. But just take a look. Any of our sessions are focused on different aspects of this to help you really take, make a material impact. Now, even with all of, those all of those activities I just talked about, we're still seeing companies you know, leverage uh, spreadsheets and access database, access databases, which can, you know, help with cost, but it can seriously impact the value creation side and the revenue side. You know that balance again. In a recent Gartner article, they focused on the mistakes that you really need to avoid when you're you're trying to reduce costs, and they highlighted a really interesting point in that article. Only nine percent of organizations create enough capacity. To, you know, in their budgets to take on the growth and innovation opportunities they want to pursue. Aggressive cost reductions can drain resources from high impact innovation projects and indefinitely delay funding to the point where competitors can hurtle right past you. We saw, you know, so they also noted that that these companies miss the opportunity, they miss the boat on adopting digital technologies. And without doing that, you know, it permanently reduces, you know, with digital technologies can help you permanently reduce the cost of doing business. You know, it's a significant impact. And it enables companies to outperform um, their competition during a looming, looming downturn. We saw this actually play out in the 2009 economic crisis. One of our customers was able to use our technology to reduce costs enough to continue to fund an engineering team. And as they came out of the downturn, they were able to be, re they were releasing features and products to market ahead of their competitors. In fact, their revenue grew, uh, they doubled over the five years following the recession. So they were able to come out of it and just ramp quickly. So, you know, as, as we look at this, it's really being thoughtful about the balance between cost reduction and value creation. It's incredibly important. And hearing from you about how, how you're trying to balance these cost reduction activities against driving value is, is really important for us. So the more that you can share with us about the challenges as well as the opportunities you're trying to pursue, that helps us to prioritize what capabilities we're developing in our applications, our user applications like AP Design, AP Pro, in our enterprise platform, <laughs> and in our cost modeling capabilities so that we can help you address the challenges and the opportunities ahead. From a user perspective, AP Pro continues to evolve. You know, we're really focusing that to support you to deliver very quick, accurate should costs and manufacturing insights driven by the assessment of your digital twins, those CAD models. And, and that's to provide you with visibility to costs, to detailed manufacturing and cost insights, the create what if scenarios that enables you to compare those design alternatives I talked about earlier and to develop refined should cost estimates. AP design, on the other hand, is really targeted at the design engineer. Um, and there's a whole track that will cover capabilities of this as we as we go through the day. But it, you know, it's getting more and more adoption from our customers because they're looking to impact costs early. From the, you know, from the earliest stages of product design. AP Design helps accelerate product in innovation while anticipating the manufacturability issues that can um, really sort of slow down time to market due to that late stage churn. Over the past couple of years, um, We've seen broad adoption of our technologies you know, for, across many different use cases. And you're going to hear a couple of great case studies about how customers are deploying it, you know, not only in one area, but across multiple. That, the deployment of our technology, I'm very happy to say, has resulted in over half a billion dollars in reducing cost of goods just in the past couple of years alone. And that doesn't reflect the, uh, uh, the uh, accelerated revenue generated by those of you who are using us to quote faster, quote more accurately, and you know, win, win bids much faster. 
So for the conference, you're going to see multiple tracks around this that cover each of the capabilities of our technologies, whether it's design, sourcing. So whatever your role is in your organization, look for the track to help you, um, you know, meet, it, it, uh, it, uh, understand what technologies that you might want to learn more about. We've also been busy working on our cost models. As you know, our cost models are based on the manufacturing simulations we develop at the core of our technology. We work to continuously improve those manufacturing simulations as well as the data in our digital factories to enable you to create a digital factory twin that represents either your own internal factories or that of your supply base. In the past, we've released enhancements. In the past year, we've released enhancements to a number of our existing models. And as you know, this is, doesn't represent all of our cost models. But you know, we've introduced enhancements to a number of our existing models, as well as introducing several new models, including compression molding, uh, enhance, uh, compression molding, roll forming, and enhancements to machining. Now. What's very interesting that some of you may not know about is leveraging that same core technology in the driven, generated by those manufacturing simulations that we use to generate cost insights. We can provide your teams with e expanded insights to address manufacturability issues and very soon sustainability, carbon impact. So lots of sessions today and tomorrow if you want to learn more about this. Moving on to challenge number two. Mitigating supply chain risk, which is a big one. How to build a resilient and agile supply chain network that, that can withstand the future disruptions. And this is critical. In a recent article from McKinsey, they estimated that a short disruption of just 30 days, just 30 days or less, can ha put 3 to 5% EBITDA margin at stake. And in these days, you, we just can't afford that. You know, there's so much pressure on costs right now that we've got to stay focused on that. So to create this resilience, it's important to think about leveraging um, technology that drives supply chain transformation to both help, help accelerate uh, speed as well as drive resilience. So here are some ideas that we're, we're seeing to help enable you to create this resilience. The first is negotiating with suppliers based on accurate estimates that match supplier costs, right? You know, you need to be in the ballpark for both of you to be on the same page and really come with a, a, a quick outcome that's meaningful to both sides without impacting the service quality that's delivered by your suppliers. Another one is reducing, reducing complexity, process complexity, and empowering buyers to facilitate quoteless sourcing. That can reduce errors as well as re result in quick turnaround time. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. Providing early visibility into product requirements and manufacturing capabilities needed for faster supplier selection. You know, again, if, you have, if, you, if your sourcing team can be looking at what's coming down the pipe from engineering, you're going to be able to you know, work faster. Enabling earlier fact-based conversations with suppliers. So having that data earlier, you can start having those conversations earlier. And then developing a strong supplier partnership through shared visibility of requirements and the uh, and understanding of the, uh, a full understanding of the supplier capabilities, you know, is really driving a much more efficient process as well as a better outcome. All of these, these aren't just ideas that I came up with yesterday for this presentation. All of these are tactics that we see many of you incorporating as you evolve your procurement approaches and interactions. So as Philippe said, you know, one of the, we want to make sure that you have time to talk to each other so that you can compare notes. Now, those are all great tactics that I just described. But how do you turn those tactics into structural resiliency so that you can be prepared for the future? Well, it requires the uh, implementation of new ways of working, you know, leveraging the digital twin, modeling end-to-end -end process from a product design to a, manu to a production perspective. In a recent article, McKinsey suggests there are four main steps to building long-term supply chain resilience. Constructing a digital twin of the most critical parts of your supply chain, you know, that digital factory that enables you to kind of understand what's happening in the manufacturing process and how it's, you know, it could impact your production from a manufacturability and cost perspective is a great example of that. Um, and having those, those digital twins, you know, enables you to do a lot of different, different activities like creating what-if scenarios, 
right? One technique to look at what you, what you might do in the future is to create what-if scenarios. Consider building several what-if scenarios that can be tested quickly, and then you, know, you could prioritize which ones are the most important. We see customers doing that not only to you know, compare, do I make it here or make it there, but even creating future factories. You know, we see, a, a, we, I, last night I was talking with a number of you. You're looking at moving uh, some of your production facilities from Asia to Mexico. What's it gonna cost, right? Well, what if you could model those digital factories and see and compare the differences between what's happening, what you're doing in Asia and what's ha what, what you might be able to do in Mexico? Um, third, another one is, is data sharing, you know, and this is, this is critical, data sharing with suppliers. And you don't need to have a complete open book. You know, we see customers do, you know, doing much more data sharing to create a more strategic collaboration with suppliers. And, and you know, they're disclosing selective information in specific contexts. You know, Caterpillar did a great study, case study, I think it was last year, where they talked about, you know, early on they used to use our, our should cost to do fact-based fact -based negotiation. And that was great, they got a lot of costs out. But what they recognized is they could take that even further if they could take the conversation to a manufacturing discussion. And so they brought our data into, a conversation with, or into conversations with suppliers where they were going through, you know, what, what the manufacturing information we provided. The supplier was looking at that saying, well, you know, I'm doing this versus that. And they were able to reduce costs significantly, which was great for Caterpillar. But on the positive side, it was a really win-win from a partner perspective because the supplier got to maintain margin. Right? So this is a whole new dynamic that we're seeing that many companies are starting to evolve to. And so, you know, McKinsey says to build structural reform, you really need to take action now. And if you don't, it's gonna have significant impacts over the next 10 years. So the methodology, uh, you know, leveraging the digital twin, creating the digital process that McKinsey describes that some of you are now leveraging through the Apriori Manufacturing Insights platform is, you know, is great. But I'd like to share a customer story of, uh, about Alstom. You know, this is, this is a great example, and I know a number of you have heard about it, but they continue to do great things with what they call their zero RFQ strategy. Um, what they've done over the past few years is they've evolved their relationships with their suppliers to create that more open, transparent discussion with their strategic suppliers. And then working with those suppliers, they leverage that data to create digital factories in a priori. What they're able to do with that is they go through the design process, you know, they get the manufacturability feedback, but at the end of the design process, they print a report out of a priori. Instead of, you know, sending requests out for quote and getting the quote back, they print a report out of a priori, and that's the PO. So they go right to the PO. And that's because the digital factory represents the capabilities and the costs of those suppliers. Now, the supplier checks it to make sure that they didn't miss anything, you know, if it's, especially if it's a new, new part or new product. Uh, and then they send the okay back, or they iterate once or twice to, to get it, uh, to cover the things that they missed. That's enabled them to reduce their quoting time. This zero RFQ has enabled them to reduce their quoting time from a couple of weeks to just a few, a few hours. So significant reduction. But hand in hand with that, you know, so it's accelerating time to, re to revenue, but hand in hand with that, They've, they've realized a significant reduction in costs, right? So again, you know, that balance of let, you know, getting products to market faster, you know, re realizing the value, the revenue value from the, these activities, as well as focusing on cost. All right, so enough about that one. You know, let's look at closing the labor and skills gap, challenge number three. And you know, a, a number of you put up your hands. You know, the skills gap is very real. Only 61% of companies really feel that college graduates are adequately prepared and trained. Um, and, you know, and, and that would be okay. But on the other hand, the job openings still are continuing to outpace the number of applicants that are in the market today. So, you know, Forbes actually expanded on this and, and, and sort of looked at it in the context of the manufacturing industry. And what they found is that manufacturers feel that, only 57% of manufacturers feel that students have been, have, have, let me back that up. Students are able to use CAD effectively. So they've been well trained on CAD. They're able to, you know, use CAD, design great products, but they don't 
65% of them indicate that students don't know about whether they're manufacturable or not, right? So they're creating these great designs, but can they be manufactured? Not necessarily. So it's creating a huge challenge that is impacting those delays to market. This is where our Manufacturing Insights platform really plays a role. You know, powered by the manufacturing simulations in our digital factories, it can help accelerate design engineers' productivity, and sometimes up to 70% in some cases. By detecting manufacturability issues earlier in the, de early in the design stages, industrial, engineer, um, uh, industrial manufacturing companies are able to you know, reduce costly iterations and develop critical design engineering skills faster and accelerate product development cycles. In the past, just in the past few weeks alone, I've had several conversations with uh, VPs of engineering who have talked about the challenges they're having bringing in these young design engineers. You know, they're able to get up and running on the CAD side, but you know, the, the products they're building aren't manufacturable. Um, I have to share this one example. This, this one VP of engineering showed me this great bracket it was a beautiful bracket, and they were going to be making tens of thousands of these, right? It had many features, you know, it was very thoughtful, thoughtfully designed. Um, however, you know, the big but, it was going to be too expensive and too hard to manufacture. So they had to go back to the design, and that was just a bracket, right? It was well intended, but you know, sometimes without the background in terms of understanding what's manufacturable and what's not, it creates these challenges. In addition to manufacturability feedback, um, there are other initiatives that can help reduce the labor and skills gaps significantly, specifically automation and collaboration. With product development cycles shortening, as I talked about earlier, market feedback is arriving faster than ever in, in addition to that, and new competitors are looming on the horizon. Automation helps new design engineers really become much more efficient and enable them to learn faster. Um, and digital collaboration enables your experts, your manufacturing and cost experts, to work in a more scalable way with those new design engineers or sourcing professionals that are coming on board um, so that you can really magnify the impact of your experts. So a priori's AP Generate is all about automation. I know a few of you have had significant exposure to that, but it's all about you know, enabling a faster feedback for those design engineers. Checking parts into the PLM system triggers AP Generate to conduct the systematic analysis of these components and then proactively lets design engineers know about manufacturability uh, and cost issues that can delay that time to market. It even offers suggestions to, uh, and it, to, uh, about how to mitigate those issues so that they can act on them. Thus, the skills of design engineers increase because they're continuously exposed to feedback and guidance, while on the other hand, the cost of products and the manufacturability issues decline significantly. So it's, 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 it's really a twofold impact. And I know there's a gentleman in the audience, and he didn't know I was going to do this, but I, I want to just share a quote from Sam Friesmeier, the former VP of uh, Vice President of Engineering at Agco. Um, about, he was talking about the impact that automation can have. And here's what he said. Our customers rely on us to provide solutions that deliver more productivity and cost less. AP Generate helps us meet that need. It automates much of the cost optimization that we currently do manually, helping us to bring designs into production faster to support critical product schedules and lead times. So that's, an, that's feedback from one of the customers who's, act, who, who's working with AP Generate. And following this session is a great session with Carrier, who's going to talk about not only automate, how they're using automation, but how they're using all of our technology to enable them to balance you know, driving costs down with uh, improving, um, improving efficiency. Now, to achieve those faster cycles, everybody across the product development cycle engineering, sourcing, manufacturing, um, you know, cost engineers, really have to work together more than ever to meet the demands of shorter time frames. We've heard that many of you, we've heard from many of you that collaboration is really key. Um, you know, it's, it's a critical initiative to, to improve productivity as well as to reduce the labor skills gap. 
an interesting survey from Deloitte that they did across US manufacturing um, companies confirmed you know, what the feedback that you've been giving us about, yeah, you've got to do something about collaboration. And the survey showed us that US manufacturers showed a strong commitment to accelerate the development of collaboration platform and tools you know, through a whole host of, of means. But collaboration tools alone don't solve the problem. You know, there's still the issue of inconsistency of data across all the different phases of the product development cycle. So you need to be looking at those two things in tandem. If you, have, if you can share the same data across all the different players, then collaboration becomes a whole lot easier. Well, that's why we've developed AP Workspace. So you're going to hear more about that later this morning, um, as well as uh, this afternoon and tomorrow. Um, one of, uh, you know, our AP Workspace application while it unifies the disconnected product teams and data, it also provides a robust co-working and task management environment to enable product designs to be optimized by cost, sustainability, and manufacturability through leveraging our manufacturing and cost data at its core. You'll learn more from Fielder tomorrow in particular about AP Workspace during the product roadmap plenary session. And if you're looking for a more hands-on uh, view into the features. Barton Finney's got a session this, a uh, this afternoon, I believe. So stay tuned. So I've talked about the first three challenges. Inflation, margin pressure, um, dealing with supply chain issues, and the labor and skills gap. But how much impact can that really have? You know, we've shared numerous case studies over the last 10 years at our conferences and our customers have as well. But recently we engaged Forrester to investigate this further and really quantify the impact. They've just released a study on the total economic impact that a priori can have over the first three years of a deployment. And they, they found that we generated a 603% ROI. That was through efficiencies generated by design engineering teams that contributed about two and a half million to that. And through a reduction of about 20 million in procurement spend um, through, through the, over the course of the three years. Now, the interesting part of it is they got an initial payback in less than six months, right? So you can get up and running very quickly. What's even more interesting is that those results were based on, on analyzing only 2% cost of goods in year two, 3% in year three, and 4% uh, in year two, and 4% in year three. So if you'd like to learn more about the analysis, you, know, don't, you, don't, you don't have to take it from me. Um, we've posted the Forrester report on our website so you can dig into the details. Okay, last challenge, so we can get on with the day. How to deliver higher profitability during economic disruption, as well as you know, addressing, starting to address sustainability. Um, as we travel around the globe, the one interesting thing we have, there's been a lot of conversations about sustainability for a couple of years, but what we're hearing now that companies are really looking at how do we move from intent to impact. Now, that would be great, except Bain raised a really big, identified a really big challenge. Only 12% of all corporate change efforts really succeed, right? That's bad enough, but the success rate for sustainability initiatives is substantially lower. It's a paltry 4%. You know, that's, that's not very good. So, the, you know, if you look at that, it's like, well, then why bother? Well, the pressure for companies to act is increasing. You know, according to the World Economic Forum, manufacturing represents 54% of the world's energy consumption and is responsible for 20% of global emissions. And the WEF also found that increases in efficiency driven by technology can materially help to reduce uh, consumption and CO2 emissions. Now, McKinsey's also looking at this. They've spent a lot of time and they've confirmed that you know, companies are trying to have an intent, but they're having challenges. And so they even took it a step further. And what they've done is they've, uh, uh, they've launched their Sustainability Academy to help companies move forward on their sustainability initiatives. Now, through their consulting, McKinsey found that although many companies have a clearly defined strategy, uh, even 100% in some sectors of the economy, the, you know, they're still having, you know, they have defined strategy, but only 40% believe that they have the knowledge and the capabilities to achieve their targets. And it isn't surprising, you know, it's an incredibly complex area and at times it's massively counterintuitive. 
But the business drivers to move sustainability initiatives from intent to impact are powerful. You know, it's both revenue and risk. Um, you know, if you look at from a risk, from a revenue perspective, customers are demand more sustainable products and are willing to pay more. So that's a great opportunity, right? And then from, um, you know, from a, uh, from a, an increasing pressure perspective, you have a lot of different new legislation and regulations that are putting pressure on companies to act and to reduce carbon emissions, whether it's the EU taxonomy or the SEC. So, you know, that, that's a real impetus. But although life cycle assessment is a popular approach for manufacturing companies to define, to define the environmental impacts of their products over their life cycle, it's complex and time consuming. And while LCA is, a, is well known by industrial manufacturing companies, it doesn't provide the guidance to reduce the CO2 impact or the CO2 footprint of products and its environmental impacts. And that guidance is what, is mo what most industrial companies we're talking to are looking for to quickly so they can quickly identify the products and the parts that are the biggest CO2 offenders in order to start that activity to drive CO2 emissions down and impact carbon footprint. So to help meet that challenge, to move from, an, uh, in, from uh, intent to impact, we're introducing a priori sustainability insights early in 2023. A priori sustainability is designed to help you generate the impact you need by providing feedback on the carbon impact of your design decisions, as well as the carbon impact of your manufacturing and sourcing decisions. So the design engineer, as he's iterating on his design and looking at you know, adding new capabilities and what the cost might be, he can also be understanding what the carbon impact is so he can reduce that before even it's released to market. And you know, cost engineers, sourcing or manufacturing professionals can be using that data to understand and assess how different manufacturing approaches can impact their carbon footprint. So by leveraging the same core technology that generates our cost and manufacturability insights, we can now, we'll be now able to give you sustainability, all from the same application. Um, so, you know, for the first time at our conference, you're gonna, there's a whole track on sustainability, so you can learn more about moving from intent to impact and improve product sustainability without harming your productivity or your profitability. So in summary, we see a priori customers supporting their users' needs across the product development cycle using our Manufacturing Insights platform, starting with quoting, you know, looking, using us to reduce the time to quote, increase the win rate, using the same resources to generate more quotes. Early in the R&D cycle, looking at you know, concept designs, but thinking about some of the ramifications of even those concepts. From a design perspective, design to cost, design to source, design for manufacturability. Um, you know, forecasting new product costs, reducing time to market, sourcing, you know, finding those needles in a haystack, you know, doing outlier analysis to find out where you should start and look for those cost reduction opportunities. Should cost analysis, enabling more informed negotiation, analyzing a greater percent of, of your buy, supplier collaboration, and then scope three emissions soon in the, in the, in the next quarter, in the first quarter of 2023. Manufacturing is also using us for developing time, time standards, capital justification, make versus buy decisions. And for those of you that are working with your quoting teams, supporting the quote process faster. And last but not least, taking pro, pro, uh, costs out of products that are currently on, on the market or reducing CO2 footprint. You know, dealing with cost engineering change orders that come as a result of market feedback. Um, you know, op identifying opportunities for reduction. So those are all those are all capabilities that are enabled by our cost, manufacturability, and sustainability insights. So, as you can see, our application platform and capabilities have grown since last year. And we're really proud to announce that in recognition of our continued innovation and of the Manufacturing Insights platform we're developing to help you achieve your goals, Frost & Sullivan awarded us their 2022 New Product Innovation Award. They cited that to create a solution, a company must understand the market's needs and deliver a solid solution um, and, that, and reliable performance. And that Frost and Sullivan finds that a priori enables, uh, embodies that concept. So, you know, if you're interested in learning more about their assessment, there's a link to this report as well on our website. In closing, 
now is the perfect time to lead, on, lead critical initiatives that respond to, day, to today's challenges of you know, inflation, skills issues, supply chain shortages, sustainability, and to drive innovation while optimizing cost and, men, and uh, mitigating environmental impact at a faster pace than ever before really requires that collaboration that I talked about. You know, it's, it's, companies need to look at this as a team sport going forward. From design to production, our manufacturing insight platform generates significant, uh, that thread of data that your teams can collaboratively use across the product development cycle, helping to drive efficiency and supporting your efforts as you drive change to meet the challenge and opportunities ahead. So, as you see, not only from the conference tracks, but also through our new capabilities that you'll hear more about the next couple of days, we're working hard to, bring profit, to make profitability and sustainability a reality for you. So really, um, you know, take, all of you in this room have a unique opportunity to drive change. Please take the opportunity over the next two days to learn, share, and debate. Right? This is the time of change, and debate drives new initiatives as well. So, Thank you for coming. I really hope you enjoy the conference. A priori, making profitability and sustainability a reality for a better world.